and fantastic. All right, I'm excited for us to be with Tiffany Christian today. I've known her a long time in so many different capacities that I said I hesitated to list all her roles this morning. So um, I'm gonna let her introduce herself in the way she wants to be known to us. And we're gonna talk about intersectionality and social justice and trauma and resilience and a bunch of exciting stuff. I think we're gonna learn a lot. So Tiffany, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, I'm so excited. Hello, everyone. Um, introductions are always weird because I just kind of live and I live in a whole bunch of circles. Um, I am probably mommy first. I've got four biological kids, two stepchildren and a son-in-law. Um, and across all of that, we've got, ooh, I've got some feedback from somebody. Yep, I'm working on mutants, a couple folks, thanks. All right, I think I got it, go ahead. All right, um, and five grandchildren. Um, so my kids range from, gotta think, weird, they're getting too old, 23 to 15. Uh, we've been in Boone for 18 years now. Um, if you've been in, in Boone for a while, you probably might know my son, RJ, he's my superstar. <laughs> but also, um, I've been a Girl Scout leader, PTA president. Um, I do a lot of outreach ministry with church. Um, I just, I believe in community. That's the biggest thing is that we are always better together. And I'm always invested in improving the place that I live. And I really believe that's why our, our family was sent to the Boone community. Like this is truly kind of a mission placement for me. Um, we're supposed to be in this community to make a change. And I know that and I try to live that. Um, a couple of things, if you guys don't know me, um, this is truly a conversation. Please jump in. If something comes up, jump in, ask me. It is not an interruption. That is the way conversations work. Don't hold it because you might forget it. And it's better to just jump in and we'll go for it. Um, Second thing, one way that Denise and I are very much alike is we are very blunt and to the point. So don't be surprised if I say something very bluntly. Um, I may not sugarcoat things and that may surprise you if you're not used to hearing me talk. Third thing, and this is the most important thing, is you cannot learn if you do not ask. So even if you're struggling with trying to find the right words, the reason that we come together in groups like this is to learn. So spit it out, however you can spit it out. If we need to correct the language, we can visit that, but spit it out so that we can get those discussions on the table, get those questions answered. Um, that's what I'm here for is to make myself available. Um, I am not thin skinned. You are not gonna hurt my feelings. If that were the case, then I shouldn't be here. So, you know, throw it at me. Let's talk about these things. Uh, I was just going back and reading through what like WCCI's vision and mission is. Think about it. The vision of this is part of it is to be a community that prevents harm, promotes well-being, and heals from our adversity. And then the mission includes language around preventing, recognizing, and treating trauma. So this work that's been going on, everybody on this call can probably name a whole list of isms that impact people. Um, and have some type of knowledge from your various backgrounds about how we need to work with them, what we need to do, how we need to address them. But we, what we don't often think about is what happens when some of those things come together. So I wanted you to think about the identity groups that you belong to. Imagine you were filling out a form and there were these checks, check boxes with categories. How many different categories would you be checking? Here's an example of just some of mine. So I've got female, black, Christian, married, Southern, heterosexual, military wife, mother, mother of a child with a disability, wife of someone with a disability, educated, artist. So you get the idea. We have lots of different identities that we juggle every single day. Now think back to probably middle school, early high school, algebra, and those graphs that everybody hated. And we're at this point on the graph and we're graphing in multi-dimensional space. So we take each of those categories and we add them into different axes on this multi-dimensional graph. Intersectionality is that one point where all of our identities come together 
to create a very unique identity. That's really cool. That's what makes us interesting as people. Um, that's the beauty of who we are, but it's really, really challenging when you look at that through the lens of social justice, disadvantage and trauma. Um, there's an, a lawyer named Kimberly Crenshaw, and in 1989, she started using the word intersectionality in the context of social justice. And she used some really cool phrases to define it. Overlapping isms, multiple levels of injustice, refusal to protect those at cumulative disadvantage. And I think my favorite is injustice squared. And so just thinking about injustice squared, what in the world does that have to do with what you guys are doing in our community? Like, how does this work? A little bit of just a brief statistic about the county to give us context. About a fourth of our population is living in part of poverty and almost half of our children in the county are living in poverty. Tiffany, let me stop you just one second, because sometimes when we say that, you've been connected to the social work department. We talk uh -huh. a lot about poverty. And when I'm in class and I tell people that Watauga County is the third poorest county in the state, um, people's mouths drop open on the floor because we think of Watauga as second home, ski slopes, and university families. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to draw attention to the stats that you're giving us, how the the extremely high rate of poverty that many of our Watauga County residents live in. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got those little pockets of extreme wealth, but you think about all those places in the back hollows where you don't drive because the roads are too curvy, they're dirt, people live there and people live there in poverty, as well as people living in the middle of town in poverty. Um, so it is everywhere. And because we talk about poverty so much, um, You've heard about it, you've thought about it, um, you, you've probably done something about it, but let's talk about intersectionality. So you start with the disadvantage of poverty. Now, what if you're poor and you can't speak English, or you're poor and you have, you're a racial minority, or you're poor and you have a disability, or you're poor and you're female? The thing is, I keep saying and, but it's not a one plus one kind of thing. It's exponential. Um, it works kind of like those investment examples where they say, if you save $5 a week for 10 years, your $2,600 turned into $3,300. Like it's not just five plus five plus five. There's this interest that adds, but it's interest in reverse when we talk about negative impact um, in a community any group of people who's dealing with multiple disadvantages. Now, unfortunately, given social media, I mean, it's good. I'm glad we can access news when we want to, but there's a downside to it. A lot of people get re-traumatized or get trauma by proxy because they see, hear, learn what's happening to others who are in similar positions as them. So it's not just that people are struggling and people are at a disadvantage, but it gets heavier and heavier every time you turn on the TV or open up your computer and your browser or open up your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, whatever it is, because you feel the weight of other people experiencing the same thing that you do. So it gets heavier and heavier and more impossible and more impossible and more overwhelming and more overwhelming beyond what you are physically experiencing in your life. So I'll give you kind of a little example from my own life, just kind of building up. So let's start being a woman in America. And there are lots of women in here. So we've got that, that point of connection. We've got wage gap issues. We've got sexual assault issues, we've got work home balance, um, victimization. So all of those are things that women deal with. Now, let's take it another category, different box. Let's look at being Black in America. We've got systemic racism. We've got targeted hatred, disproportionate police brutality. We've got wealth gaps, education gaps. But when you put those two things together, 
it's compounded. Women make less than men, black people make less than white people. So what does a black woman make? It compounds. Blacks are more likely to be subject to hate crimes. Women are like, more likely to be victims of violence. So what kind of risk does that put a black woman at? Um, so with that, thinking about me talking about social media and news and that kind of thing, every story of violence against a black woman is much more personal to me. Every story of violence against a black man is much more personal to me because I am the mother of black men. So it's not just dealing with what you see in front of you. It's the compound effect of the, of the multiple things you don't see and that re-traumatization that happens when the, these things happen to your same group of people. I down on my notes. Um, so it's the closest thing I can relate it to for you guys is compassion fatigue. And most of you probably have experienced that. Um, you get burned out. Sometimes you have um, vicarious trauma because you work with people who've dealt with such horrific things. Compassion fatigue is real. It can impact people in very serious ways. But I'd like you to consider the fact that no matter how deep that is, you can still walk away, recover, and choose not to face it again. So if you're working with victims of sexual assault and you get overwhelmed, even if you have to go to therapy for it, you can walk away and not have to work that intensely with those victims again. You can walk away from that trauma because it's not part of your core identity. It's what you choose to do as a job. But that's probably the closest facsimile to what it feels like to have this intersectionality to continue to build and build and build. That's a really good point that you make. And I hadn't thought about it in terms like that is that most of the times the roles that we occupy, we cannot step out of. Like it's rare um, mm -hmm. for some of them. And like, even when our children are grown, we're still a mom. Um, and it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to change our gender, to change our race, to change even the class that we belong to frequently. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something where we can choose to just walk away. We're going to have the impacts of these multiple identities. Um, and so there's a sense of real powerlessness right. that comes with you know feeling like you are, that you don't have a lot of power to change your circumstances. And even with, with you know, looking at class, it's not just about money, but it's about the culture. So you can make more money, but still not be part of the culture of the next class. So you're still stuck where you were just with more money than you had. Um, so even if something that looks as easy to change as socioeconomic status, I don't care how much money you make, it's so much more than just the money in the bank that makes acceptable social groups when it comes to class. Oh. I'm sure you're going to get to this. So at some point in our conversation, I hope we're getting ready to have a discussion about, so if you can't walk away from the identities that you have, and we talk about this in other conversations, what are the ways we help people build resilience? But I may mm -hmm. get to that before you're ready to, so we can come back to it. If well, I mean, I'm, I'm about to, my, my next thing on my notes literally is, what does this mean for WCCI and the work it is trying to do? Because <laughs> literally... My next thing. Um, one thing that really struck me when I was preparing for this, um, and as my grandma said, common sense ain't common. So <laughs> for some of you, you're gonna go, duh, but some things have to be said so that you know it was said. Um, a lot of times we think of people as lazy, unmotivated, resistant, too angry, too bitter, too hostile, and they're just tired. They're tired of trying to survive. They're tired of putting one foot in front of the other. They don't have the energy to be nice to you. They don't have the energy to be polite to you because they're just tired. And that doesn't mean they don't want any better. It doesn't mean that they're not trying to do, but they're just out of resources, out of physical, mental, and emotional resources because it takes all that they have to stay alive. 
It takes all that they have to get food on the table and get their children what they need to be. And they don't have any extra resources. So I think sometimes reframing some of the behaviors we see and the attitudes that we see that look negative and think about like, why do they need to be nice to me? Like, really? What do they owe me that they need to be nice to me? You know, what do they owe me that they need to trust me? How, why do, do they have any reason to think this is going to be any different than the how many ever other years they've lived their lives? Like people really have no reason to believe in you, um, to trust you, to think that whatever you're saying is going to work. Um, because often these identities, a lot of them are like, I've been, my family has been black. Oh, hold on, Tiffany. I, I got it. <laughs> that was okay, up. Sorry. I was trying to mute somebody else and it moved right when I did it and it hit you. That's okay. Uh, but like, you know, my family's been black for generations. So this generational identity, I've had, I've got like genetic memory and family stories about why it makes no sense to do X, Y, Z. People have been poor for generations. They've learned their habits. They've had stories passed down about what works and doesn't work. Um, there's been, you know, women have struggled for generations. There are things that we have just, we just know don't work. And we're not going to believe you if you say it does. What were you going to say, Denise? Um, what you said about why do we expect people who are in trauma to treat us a certain way? Um, I think about all my social work classes where we talked about how to reframe behavior in a strength-based way. So instead of saying a mom is difficult or uncooperative or whatever, we say, I haven't yet found an effective means of communication. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying goes even further back than that. And that is when we label somebody as difficult, we're expecting them to meet a certain standard that we're basing on an experience that is not theirs. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's an interesting concept for me. And we talked last week, I think it was, um, the person who was talking who has a trauma history said, the message was clear that I was a good, a model client. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked right, I looked the part, I showed up for appointments, I was articulate, I was respectful. And she said, even, even I realized that, that, that that's the exception, that that's not how we should be judged. So what you're saying about, you know, taking, having this expectation of people from trauma that they behave in a way that's socially acceptable, that's, um, that's really resonating with me. I mean, and, it, and I think, unfortunately, um, we're seeing this play out in the news when we're looking at, I mean, I just on my Facebook today, and I didn't intend to talk about this, but this is the nature of conversations. On my Facebook today, posted a video of this white guy who got pulled over by the cops. And he was very obstinate. He had a gun on his seat, um, refused to get out of his car, continued to argue with the cops. At one point, told the police officer to put his gun away, and the police officer did. And by the end of this, this white guy is driving away from this interaction with the cops never having gotten out of his car as they asked him to. And we've seen police cops play out quite differently for people of color, but it's an expectation. People expect him not to be violent. They expect him not to, to do anything rash. And so they give him the opportunity to live up to that expectation. Mm -hmm. Whereas they other people have expectations and not this is not anti-police, not all police. But as a society, we have come to adhere to some of these stereotypes. Everybody in our society is not limited to just law enforcement. But we have certain expectations of the way black males may behave. And so we react to those expectations and make them happen. So certain people are given opportunities to live up to expectations and other people are they're opportunities are short circuit because we've already determined the conclusion. We've yeah. already determined they're not going to succeed. You don't know. You can't see all the successes they've had that you take for granted. Um, another kind of example of not seeing people's effort and success. I have a child that's on the spectrum. Um, 
most people who interact with him have absolutely no idea. And he was struggling in school and he wasn't, he's not a behavior problem. He just can't get it together to get things done sometimes. He's scatterbrained. And so his sister was really frustrated um, with some things we were dealing with. And she said, it's not fair. He has to white knuckle through his day when everything is so easy and intuitive for the other kids. And that really resonated with me because on the surface, you see the same kids doing the same things, getting to close to the same outcomes, but we don't see how many of their resources it takes to get to those outcomes. And that's kind of where intersectionality plays into it, is it's pulling more and more and more of your resources, every disadvantage that you have, to get to that same basic outcome where some people just get out of the bed and they're there because they're not facing those challenges. Makes sense. Um, were you gonna say something, Denise? Go ahead. Nope, just taking a breath. <laughs> I forget to breathe. <laughs> um, another mind. thing is treating one symptom and ignoring the rest is not very effective. And sometimes we can do more harm than good because it throws off that balance of survival that people have established. Mm. Um, remember how we thought it was a good idea as a nation to take Native American children from their families to educate them? Like, no, that threw off the balance of their culture because we had this great idea. Um, or we bust children in the 60s from poor schools that had limited resources but they were in places that cared about them, were invested in their success, and we sent them to well-funded schools that didn't want them there, didn't welcome them, and didn't understand them. So treating that education inequity, oh, we'll just send them to a school that's got more stuff, took away the support system that they had in their communities where the people were really invested in them. Um, so we've got to identify and recognize all the factors so that we don't inadvertently become destructive as we're trying to fix things. What would you have thought was a better idea, Tiffany, in that era? And, and resource the schools and the communities that the children were in. It was, it was the making the resources more equitable as opposed to removing those children and, and busing them to a completely foreign environment. Um, and in some places they did, you know, some teacher busing. <laughs> so they put better trained teachers into those communities and, and tried to help balance the schools that way. But to take a kid totally out of their comfort and their environment and their support system, they're not going to learn as well. I don't care how good the school is because they don't feel like they belong. But didn't they, weren't they able to go back home and have their support system again? It wasn't like they were living in the other community. But, but even in the context of the school, if you're sitting eight hours a day in a place that somebody thinks you're ignorant, you don't feel welcome, you're not comfortable, they really don't believe you can succeed, you're not going to do well. Um, and that's that self-fulfilling prophecy that gets created as opposed to being in an environment where people are invested in your success, are not gonna give up on you, know that you can do it, and are more encouraging. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's no perfect answer. Too, right? No. I heard someone else chime in, who was that? Yeah, it was me, Tiffany, my name is Tiffany too, but I was gonna say, and, and also know the culture. Right. Um, and and there's, there's some places where people were, sensitive enough to blend the two and do it right. Um, my husband grew up in Richmond, Virginia and, and was, was subject to, he's 10 years older than me, he was subject to that busing in a foreign environment um, and dropped out, actually dropped out of school because it was so awful. Um, but if they still have their ACEs community to go back to, I mean, some of them are coming from that ACEs background, which we didn't even know about them. Mm -hmm. you know so I mean I, I'm just I'm just brainstorming here yeah because it's it's you know I, we can we can we can say negative things or tear things down but I'm always like well what would you do to make it what would and, you know how do we make it positive what would have been the the answer the solution and 
and by talking to each other, sometimes we can come up with ideas. Right. And I think we're still seeing some of those issues in the education equality now where people have been very creative in how they draw districts um, and schools are funded by their tax base. So you can easily create poor schools and rich schools, white schools and black schools, upper class schools and lower, you know, you can, you can district those things very creatively to create, to have pockets of really bad schools near really good schools because the people with the money in the really good schools don't want those kind of kids going to their school. Um, so there, there are ways to, to be more equitable in the distribution and not create have and have not situations um, artificially. Sometimes, you know, the geography just, it is what it is. There are places that are riddled with poverty. That is the, that is the reality. But a lot of times we help that by being creative in whether it's how they district things, um, it's property values, it's history, long history of those types of things that cause it to persist. And we have to break that cycle. If we can't break that cycle of that geographic locking in of poverty. But see, I know in Winston-Salem, there's some very poor areas there. And I talked to a teacher and she was all excited about being with these kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and she found out they had so many other problems. They just, the room was still chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it, I think, was probably the ACEs that they were dealing with at home. So I don't really, I mean, it's just very complicated. It is, it is. It really is. Well, and I like your point, Tiffany, that sometimes the best of intentions with interventions create other problems that we didn't anticipate. And this, I think, is just a really basic um, example of that. But I think about some of the families I've had in my office where I was working with one of the parents, the mom or the dad, and you send them out with this beautiful intervention plan that you've created and they go home and it causes all this friction because either they're not the spouse in power or um, another family member, you know, grandmother is the one who has to approve things and they weren't at the table or you're, they're not, they don't feel like they have enough trust to be honest about, they can't access the resources that you brainstormed mm -hmm. them. And so the idea that you, it has to work in the context of their life. But to know that there has to be trust. Um, you have to have that relationship so that they can be honest about what will work for them and what not. But that well-intentioned possibly causing a host of other problems. Right. And we'll, we'll kind of get away from, from race-based movement. Um, I was just thinking about this past school year um, and some of the challenges that we had with virtual school and I am the first one to come to Pittsburgh. I do not fight with my teachers. I am a full supporter of public school because I wouldn't want the job. No, <laughs> um, I understand the challenge and I understand that what we were facing is unprecedented and nobody could have seen these coming. So this is more of the things that we learned and not being critical in the negative sense. But we did learn a lot as we started to unfold this and reflecting here are some of the things that I just thought about and what we've learned this year. So with the virtual school, when we knew kids weren't going back to school and hot spots were available and the kids had their laptops, so good, we could do virtual school. Some kids still live too far out that the hot spot is useless. Like there is no signal for the hot spot. So I don't care how many free hot spots we have, they still can't access the internet. If your electricity is cut off, the hot spot won't work and you can't charge your laptop. You know, so we've got those kinds of issues that we need to be aware of and address, or we're assuming all these kids are equipped for success. Why isn't this kid doing their homework? They must be dumb. They must be that. They don't have any electricity. That's why they're not doing their homework. Um, or we've got, you know, multi, multiple siblings in the household. The parents are still working. Those older siblings have to watch and pour and cook and all for the younger kids. They don't have time to do schoolwork because they're taking care of kids all day. Um, or if they were depending on school for food, and we did do, I did do some lunch deliveries, we were part, my church was part of that. We can't reach everybody. So we still had kids, I'm sure, that weren't eating like they would have if they had been at school. We can deliver, we can offer pickup. You got to have a car to pick it up. 
You gotta be willing to have somebody come to your house to deliver. So, you know, there's still, you gotta trust somebody to come to your house. If you're already on the margins and you're afraid somebody might take your kids and you don't know who's gonna be snooping, you don't want anybody delivering something to your house while you're not home. You don't think that's safe. So even though we were delivering food, that wasn't an option for all people. Um, and your intersectionality, Tiffany, I hadn't thought about it in terms of this, but it's almost like a continuum from able to access resources and be successful to can't access any resources and are completely unsuccessful. And all those identities you're talking about move you on the continuum. Someone typed in the chat that they struggled to keep their child engaged and it's a two-parent home, he's in education. Same at our house, I'm in education, two-parent home, all the resources in the world. We're lucky my 17 year old is still in school because she <laughs> wants to drop out on a daily basis. And so when you add in, are there two people in the house? Is it a single mom? Is it somebody that has to work or they're not gonna survive? Like every identity that you add in mm -hmm. made it more of a challenge to keep the kid engaged and to make sure they had what they needed to be successful. So I had thought about it in terms of the compounding impacts of those identities. And then we, we, assume, we assume they have the level of problem solving skills that we have. We assume they have the level of comfort with processes that we have. We make basic assumptions that people can fill out forms. We still have people who don't read well enough to handle government forms. That's real. Um, so to say, oh, you just apply for X, Y, Z, not so much. Um, the third big point that I was thinking, this kind of goes back, you know, when you think about all these things that add up in a person's life and how like, you're like, oh my goodness, this is too big. Like, I can't do this. These are too many things coming at me. Um, and that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next week um, in detail, but a little preview of that is that social justice can actually be a restorative spiritual practice if you're approaching it with the right mindset. If you think about it, most major religions have some type of version of the golden rule. You know, um, even those who don't subscribe to organized religions still have concepts like karma and the greater good and connectedness. Like as humans, there is something within us that tells us we should be connected to other people. We should be doing things for other people. We should be giving back to our society, our community somewhere outside of ourselves. Um, so if you think about it, when we realize how complex our social injustice system is, it actually reveals to us lots of opportunities and there's space for every single person to do something. There's no excuse for standing on the sidelines because when we see how big it is, when we get that overwhelming feeling, we know it's necessary for every single person to be involved. So reframing it as opposed to being overwhelmed and like, oh my God, this problem is too big. What am I gonna do? It's too complex. I can't understand it all. You know you can do something and that every contribution is needed to attack this problem. So whatever your little piece is, we need that little piece because the problem is indeed so big. You and I didn't talk about this, but the um, logo for the conference this year is puzzle pieces. <laughs> Exactly for that reason, because we all fit together and everybody, you know, without, if any of the pieces are missing, it's not complete. And so each one of us has a piece. And if we all do our pieces, then the, then the thing comes complete. So I don't know if you knew that, but great job. <laughs> Here we go. We're on the same wavelength. That's right. Um, we've heard from a couple of people. I'd like to hear from other people. What are you thinking? What are your questions? Is this making sense? Am I insane? Like, talk to me. I don't like talking to myself. Uh, you had mentioned talking a little bit more about this next week. And what Tiffany's referring to is that she's doing a session at the conference, um, at the WCCI virtual conference next week, Thursday and Thursday. And so if you haven't yet signed up for the conference and you'd like to hear more from Tiffany, um, there are still spots available. We are still accepting people. So 
um, to see um, what else we said. Um, just some, it really resonated with people that social justice can be a restorative spiritual practice. Um, and I liked what you said about, well, I think we hear it a lot. If you think we're overwhelmed hearing about it, then imagine what it's like to live it mm -hmm. and how um, doing something, anything, you know, whether it's serving a meal at the hospitality house or being a volunteer coach or whatever it is that you feel like is the part that you're supposed to play, that every little bit can make a difference. And I think one part of that is, I don't know how we, we made this turn as a culture, but we got in this, this attitude that giving money to something was somehow bad and not doing enough. I'm sorry, every nonprofit organization on this planet needs money. Like if that is what you're able to give, that is a welcome thing too. I don't know how we, I just don't know how we got there. Oh, they're just throwing money at, I'm sorry, throw money this way. I will make good use of it and help solve this problem. Um, it, yeah. It's not a negative thing to throw money at something. Um, that's, that's useful. Money is very useful um, when you're working and doing the kind of work that most of you do. I wanted so, to share, um, interesting, something came up when you were talking, Tiffany, Christine, Dave, and actually my partner and I were talking about this last night. He has a friend who is a retired uh, ASU police officer and he gave him this advice and I thought, oh my goodness. So he told him that if you're ever driving in your car and a police car is like alongside you, do not look that police officer in the eye. You just keep looking straight ahead. So I said, what does that mean? He said that the police officer would take it almost as uh, an affront, like you're challenging the person. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is just ridiculous. But he also said, my partner, that he used that advice several years ago. We were in another state driving and the officer pulled up beside him and he said he could tell the officer kept looking at him and he just kept looking straight. He must have followed him for like, I don't know, two miles or more and just finally drove off somewhere else. Um, but also uh, we lived in Boone like 30, going on over 30 years now. And he's had an instance where he was driving in his car and an officer locally stopped him uh, for not giving a signal to make a left turn, I don't know, in some small area. And he could tell that uh, it was just uh, because of the color of his skin is why he was stopped for uh, something absurd, you know, like that. So I, you know, I don't know what to say, like regarding this continuous kind of behaviors based on what a person looks like and you know nothing about them, but in your mind, you've made judgments about them as we know very well nationally and how many years this has been going on. So it just strikes me and I really appreciate the compounding of the in intersectionalities that we all live with and have to deal with every day. And, and one thing I want to say, um, and here's one, here, here's one of my moments. I'm going to be real blunt because um, I can't see a lot of you, but I recognize some names. There are mostly white people on here. Um, here is the point with what's going on in our country and police injustice, um, police brutality, and all of those things. Even if you in your heart believe that every single death was justified, that is between you and your God. However, what you do have to accept is that that still invokes fear and anxiety in people that look like me. So even if you don't believe any of the officers did anything wrong, if you're gonna help somebody, you have to start in their reality where they are with how they are experiencing life. If you can't start with where they are 
in their reality, you're not going to be any good to them. One thing I think is important to say um, is that this, this is not something, if you attribute this to law enforcement um, or people living in the South, um, I would like to propose that a lot of us do this as humans, that we look at someone and make a judgment. Um, the other day, I had been talking to somebody on the phone um, and we had talked on the phone three or four times and based on what they were telling me, I didn't even realize this, but then they came to school to pick something up. And when I saw them, I was <laughs> shocked because in my mind, I had expected them to look and act a certain way. And I'll just be really honest about it. And so that was um, one of, you know, one of those moments that you call whatever jaw dropping, convicted, whatever you want to say, where I realized that I had taken all these stereotypes that I had in my head and projected an image of who I thought this person was going to be like. And that's not what happened at all. So I would argue that um, it's no one profession or class that does that, that I think that's what we do as humans. Is Here, here's, we, here's my confession. White man with a bald head and a bunch of tattoos. I'm scared. Now I have known white men that look like that, that were the sweetest, most gentlest people on the world. So I have to check that in myself. If I see somebody like that, I have to go, wait a minute, you don't know that person. You can't make a conclusion about how they're going to be until you have some concrete information to go on. But there are things from years of life that are in me that cause me to want to jump to a conclusion that I have no evidence to support. Because our brains are really tiny and they're really little and they like categories because it makes thinking easier for us. Um, and so those little tiny brains like shortcuts. And a lot of times that works for us, but we just have to be aware of when those shortcuts aren't the best thing for us to do. Um, and so that, that's the shortcut I had to work on because when, I, especially when I first moved here, it seemed like they were everywhere. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? Um, and so just having to learn and being willing to grow and going, girl, that's stupid. Like really looking at myself and going, this is a sweet, kind man. I have, he has not been to prison. He has not killed anybody. He has not done all these things that your head is running away with. So get a grip on yourself and act like you got better sense. Yeah, what? so it's all that implicit bias stuff that mm -hmm. we talk about, about the things that we bring to the table um our own and sometimes you know i have to be honest the, the experiences that i had growing up and as a young adult made me predisposed to react to certain people in a way when you were talking about meeting expectations and so when i bring my stuff to the experience and mm -hmm. act in a certain way that then whatever i was expecting to happen happens I mean, it's so, it's so complicated and complex right. but um, one of the things that we're here to talk about is social justice and ways to um, kind of try to offset some of those trauma um, right. intersectionality things. So keep talking to us about that. I had somebody was going to jump in and it sounded like a male voice. Who was it? Yeah, it was me. My name is Sean Horton. And speaking of, I just, I've had several life experiences. And by the way, I just happen to be black and with a bald head with tattoos and all that <laughs> other good stuff. And, uh, you know, I just remember, you know, and, and Tiffany you may be able to relate or some other people may be able to relate that growing up, my grandparents, we, you know, in the community that I lived in, we had aunts and uncles, grandparents, big mama, et cetera. And they would often talk about how we would interact with the police. And if, you know, a policeman does A, B, C, and D, then you're supposed to act a certain way. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. And all that other stuff. Well, I was pretty compliant with that for a very long time. And then I realized as I got into my young adult years, um, hell, they're just like me. You respect me. I'm going to give you respect. You disrespect me. I'm going to disrespect you as well. But I'm going to be a little bit nicer about it. Knowing that, you know, someone has the ability to take your life in an instant over a simple turn signal or not given one, that is <clears throat> beyond tragic. 
I have a son, I have a daughter, and you know, it's most people do not have to deal with what I have to tell my children that other people don't. You know, I have to tell my kids, you know, you can't do A, B, C, and D, or you can do it, but blah, 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 blah. And so it's just, it's really, it's really different having to walk in two different worlds because I know how my world exists inside of my home. I know how my world exists back in the community in which I grew up. And I know the world in which we currently have to deal with. And it's just, um, sometimes it's very disheartening. And I typically, um, I, I always try to remain positive about th something or about a lot of things, but there's conversations that I have with my family members, uh, speaking of like my mom and cousins and stuff that I don't have with the general populace because I feel that our views are going to be different. So I can go back home to a nurturing, secure environment and say, A, B, C, and D. And I know it's safe. I know I'm going to feel good with, with um, you know, with the conversations. And sometimes the conversations are just a little bit unnerving and unsettling in our own community. But um, fortunately, I mean, once again, I've had pretty good experiences through my life. I've had some rough things, but I try to prepare my children for the reality of the world in which they live in, because you know, we all know there's some conversations that you don't have in front of your children that they're not privy to because they're not of age to understand certain things. But then there's conversations that we have with our children that it's like, you know, this is life or death for you. So you have to understand this is why I'm so strict. This is why if I tell you to do something or this is why you have to do that because the world is a little bit different. With that being said, that's that's all I need to say. Thanks, Thank you, Sean. Yeah. And um, I think one thing that stood out from what Sean said, um, but I think every single person can learn from is he talked about there are certain conversations you can have in certain places because those people understand. And what I would challenge everybody here to do is to think about where are the places you would not understand the conversations. Where are the people you wouldn't have those conversations with because they, they didn't understand? And purpose yourself to make genuine relationships in those places. Um, and when I say genuine relationships, I don't mean y'all gotta be best friends. What I mean, sometimes these are functional genuine relationships. I have some relationships with people that they are my social informants. They are my, we have a relationship so that they can teach me and I can learn. Or they, we have a relationship so I can teach them and they can learn. And that is the explicit purpose of that relationship. And there's nothing wrong with that if everybody involved in that agrees to those terms. So if there's something that you don't get, if there's a way of life that you don't understand, develop a relationship with somebody to be like, listen, I really just need to learn more. Can you help me? Most people aren't offended by honesty. They aren't offended by vulnerability. I am really just stupid and ignorant when it comes to this thing. Can you help me get better? That is not an offensive question to people. Now, they may not want to help you, but you're not going to say anything to offend them by being vulnerable about where your shortcomings are. That is not a negative approach. Um, so I'm just thinking about like, how can we, how, that's how you understand the intersectionality. That's how you understand, oh, I thought if I just did X, Y, Z, but I really didn't understand what it's like to be working third shift at McDonald's. And I can't, and they can't get up and they can't take time off and they can't, like, I didn't, I don't understand what it's like to have to have, an, have my kid interpret things for me. I don't understand what it's like not to physically be able to get into certain environments because of a disability and how that limits what I can do. Or, you know, to have a processing disorder and not be able to understand verbal instructions. And what there's so many things that if we just kind of think of what we don't know, what people wouldn't, the same people that wouldn't understand you, you probably wouldn't understand them. So that's the that's your first list. What people wouldn't understand me if I made this list, I can't talk to them because they wouldn't understand, that's where you need to start. That's where you need to start reaching out to deeper understand some of those factors as they impact people in our community. 
Tiffany. Who's that? Sorry, can you hear me? It's me. It's Tiffany. I was just going to say that I think it's really um, important for us to remember, like something that Sean just said is the fact that um, there's a conversation that he has to have with his children about what you do when law enforcement pulls them over. That's um, a conversation that I don't have as a privileged white person with my two children. The conversation that I have with my children is that if you see a person of color um, in a situation like that, that's, that is, is not going well, that is wrong, you intervene and we'll sort out the consequences later. Um, the, the fact that we have to have those conversations or that those conversations exist, that's a problem. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that for all of us that are not persons of color on this call to, to realize, I mean, that, that may not be your truth, but I know for my family and for a lot of uh, folks in, in my community that I'm at, that's, that's not a conversation we even have to, to think about having. And that's not okay. And I think that that goes back to doing what you can in a situation of, of injustice and disadvantage, whatever that thing is you can do and empowering the people around you to do what they can for whatever situation that is. Um, and it may not be a situation where somebody's life is on the line, but it may be a situation, you know, a mother can't go to work because she doesn't have anybody to watch their kids. If you're sitting at home, you can watch the kid. <laughs> you know, like there are things everybody can contribute and putting on that lens to go, you know, what don't I understand? What am I missing here? What pieces of the puzzle can I not see? Where am I making assumptions? Those, the, the, the missing parts. They talk a lot in social work classes, Tiffany, about cultural competence. And just in the past year or so, I've been reading more and more about how that's not really something we can achieve. That you right. never, unless you live in a culture, you never achieve competence in a culture that's not your own. And so it is this continual process of trying to understand where people come from and the different experiences. I married into a um, traditional Appalachian family. And if and 30 years later, there's still little things that come up. And I'm like, oh, I never knew that's where that came from. But it's it's been a 30 year educational process. It's very, very, very complex and is different for every person based again on all these roles that you're, it's different for the men, it's different for the women, it's different for the children with disabilities, it's different depending on the education that you have and how much money you make and whether or not you drive yourself and if you can read and write, all of those identities make that experience different. And so, you know, to say, it's a con every day it's a learning process and kind of I think you and I approach this the similar way of what can I learn about mm -hmm. people today kind of thing it's it's ongoing and it's complex and it you know it's based on people's histories and where they come from and um, we come from Boone which is a pretty safe town and we have um, officers who are very invested in the work of WCCI and implicit bias training and so your experience with officers in Boone could be completely different from, you know, if you lived somewhere else possibly. Mm -hmm. And so there again is another continuum on not only what that's like for us as people in the community, but what it's like for us as officers. Exactly. Uh, you know or love an officer. And so that was one of the things that Kat Eller, who works for Boone PD, she's on this call, put in the chat is, um, you know, happy to have a conversation with anybody about this and at any time. So the complexity of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, 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 I'll wrap it up with, a, with an example that a lot of, I see a lot of familiar faces who have kids in the school system of, of an example of intersectionality that's very, very relevant for us in the wintertime. When that phone rings and it's Wayne on the other end of the phone and school is canceled. Have you noticed what your social media looks like? Everybody who lives in the middle of town is ranting and raving. Why did kids leave school? We could have went to school. There's no snow on the ground. People in the county are going, had to cancel school. 
<laughs> it's ice on my driveway. You can't get around my mountain. Um, and I laugh because it inevitably the division is the people who live in town who drive their kids to school in SUVs are ready for their kids to go to school because it is very easy for their kids to go to school. In order for my child to go to school, they've got to walk a tenth of a mile, stand out in the cold to wait on the bus. I don't want them doing that in the wind chill is negative five. But people who are living in a different world, who jump in the car and drive their kids to school, aren't thinking about those other factors. So you know, on a very practical level, something as simple as your response to when school is canceled is the intersectionality of your realities and what is doable and what is not doable for you, what is reasonable and not reasonable for you on a decision just that little. So think about what it means when it's food, shelter, life, safety that is at stake and the intersectionality of all the roles that you play come together to make that harder, to make that easier for you. So we'll start wrapping up, Tiffany. Thank you for all these ideas that you have brought to us to make us think. Um, one of the last comments was thinking of cultural humility rather than cultural competence, which is what we we're just talking about. Um, for the people on the call, if you will put any comments that you have for Tiffany in the chat, I will copy them all and send them to her so she has them. Um, any last, let's see, one thing we didn't touch on that'll carry us right on out of here like okay. a soundtrack is what do you do to stay well? Roll up my sleeves. I think that's why I wear so many hats. Um, my, how I deal with the, the weight of the world right now, how I deal with um, healing myself from, from some traumatic backgrounds that I have, how I deal with life is really rolling up my sleeves to empower other people. If I felt a pain, I don't want other people to have to feel that pain the way I felt it. If I can do something to prevent it, to help them get over it quicker, it, that, that's how I, I stay well, is rolling up my sleeves. If I'm not doing something to help, then I'm sitting in my own worry and in my own pain, and I'm letting the problem get worse. Um, so for me, self-care, I mean, like, Helping is essential to my self-care. Rolling up my sleeves, being involved in my community is how I stay mentally healthy. Perfect, perfect timing too. If you wanna spend more time with Tiffany, um, register for the conference next week. She's gonna be with us um, sharing her wisdom. Um, we will not have Wednesday conversation next week because of the conference. So um, you'll have some extra time anyway that you could come and be with us for that. So. Thanks again, Tiffany. It was great to be with you as always. And I hope that the rest of your day goes well. And I look forward to seeing everybody here at Wednesday Conversation in two weeks. So um, take good care. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>